Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 03636 59 0703 768 Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. Second Kings 3, I'll read verse 16, I'll read verse 17, and verse 18. And he said, Thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water that you may drink both ye and your cattle and your beasts and this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord it will deliver the Moabites also into your hands will you please read Ecclesi Ecclesiastes chapter 11 Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 1 I'll quickly go to verse 6 1 to 6 cast your bread upon the waters for thou shalt find it after many days give a portion to seven I mean yes and also to eight for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall towards the earth or towards the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall be. He that observes the wind shall not sow. And he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. As thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who makes all. In the morning, sow thy seed, and in the evening, withhold not your hand, for thou knowest not whither shall prosper, Either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. May God bless his word to our hearts this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. When we came at the opening church, I shared with you that there are two reasons that God has allowed us to call this meeting and that there are two reasons why God brought you to be part of MLR uh, this year and I said the first reason is for you yourself to become one of those ditches God is digging through to enlarge your capacity to hold the water of life for the blessing of your people. That that's the first issue that God has located you, has cited you as one of those ditches that if it is properly dug, if it is dug deep, if it is evacuated of layers upon layers of rubbish 
And if God were to prevail over your life and he can put in the drill equipment, the spiral screw that goes deep down, God says there is capacity in each one of your lives to actually become a resource for resourcing the land, for bringing about the blessing of God and for causing revival to break forth in the land. That's the first reason. The second matter that God raised for us is that you yourself might be enlisted among his servants who are ditch diggers or well diggers. These are men and women who have committed themselves to do a selfless, silent labor behind the scenes, preparing themselves and preparing others for the coming outbursts. We said raising men for God is a silent labor. It is not first the platform that such men are seeking. They just want to dig out rubbish from the lives of men until they become presentable to the king. They are ready to do the dirty job of sorting men out until they are fit for the master's use. Two reasons. And as we were going through the meeting, as we were going through the meeting, I was conscious and praying that the two objectives that God has outlined for bringing you into this meeting this year, that God will not allow us to conclude without us reaching that objective. Hallelujah. But while I'm dealing with the two reasons, one reason comes before the other. Are we together? And I feel very convinced that the first reason precedes the second. And the first reason actually is the crucial one that we automatically get to the second reason for God bringing you here. So the first reason is that God is, is, has decided that despite your past experience, despite all that went wrong, despite all that was not congruent, all that you have tried to do and you have not been able to achieve much, God has decided that he's citing you as one of those ditches. Those who will become wells. Wells of salvation. Wells of deliverance. Wells of living water that is capable of resourcing the land once God begins to break forth with you. If that happens, we know as God begins to dig deep into your own life, you are also going to be engaged in the second aspect, becoming ditch diggers, reaching out to helping others to also find the release of their lives into what God wants them to be. Hallelujah. Vacillating between two big objectives, we might find ourselves struggling. Where do we end the meeting? And I would like to say to you that the two reasons, they are concurrent. Even though one is like the mother of the second, 
Hallelujah. Unless God has dug into your life, you have no capacity of digging into any other person's life. Am I right? Unless you yourself, you have become a well that is springing up. You are not able to refresh anyone else. So, while we are ending, we will be ending on the note still of you becoming that deep ditch. But automatically, as your life begins to release the freshness, automatically, you will become one of the ditch diggers in the nation by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So this morning, I'm still going to focus on this process of becoming ditches for the coming revival. And the process that we began to introduce yesterday is the matter of discipleship. And I intend that as we have studied discipleship all over the two days, I'm going to be drawing the last bit of the outline and tying them together before we get to praying and breaking into smaller groups, smaller groups where we can deliberately discuss how to push the digging of the ditches further than where we have reached now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, but before I will get into this, the two passages I've read says, you shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain. Yet, yet, the word that is attracting me this morning is yet. You know the word yet means notwithstanding. Despite the fact that you may not see wind and that you may not see rain, the land shall be filled with water. And as I read that, I became completely satisfied that actually, if we will concentrate on digging ditches, on making boreholes, into lives of men and it gets so deep enough the water that shall gush forth will be sufficient to overrun the land. It might even be much more effective than a windy rain. It might be much more enduring than the wind that is blowing and throwing up things so I determined in response to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. He said, He that observes the wind shall not sow. And he that regarded the clouds shall not reap. And I understood what God is saying is this. Stop looking around. Stop looking at the contradictions everywhere. Bend down. Begin to dig ditches. Begin to dig ditches. You will see this land filled with water in a very short while to come. Begin to dig ditches. Don't be distracted. Don't be distracted 
Don't be diverted into this or to that or to this or to that. Stop looking at winds. And stop looking for the wind. As if God is saying, I've told you what to do. And I will fill the land with water. And I became much more resolved. That digging ditches, even though it's a very, very laborious work, it is very, very dirty to evacuate rubbish until you get fresh water. That is what to do. And if we are breaking forth from this meeting, that's what we are going to break forth to go and do. Hallelujah. But the first set of men and women that God wants to begin with as his ditches is myself and yourself. Are we together? Are we together? So this morning, we will press a bit further about our own personal discipleship. How can I press on with my own personal discipleship until the ditch that God is digging into my life gets deep and deep and deeper until we can touch the water level where water gushes forth without fail, water that can resource the entire community and it will never finish. That's the issue that we want to conclude with concerning you, concerning myself. You remember that yesterday morning as we were pressing on the matter of I did say something that I have not been able to push away from my mind. I did say that water does not dwell on the surface. And actually surface water is not drinkable. I hope you know that. I also noted that death is what determines the capacity of a well, not width. Are you getting me? And I did say that even if you, if you make a trough, 20 miles wide but 2 feet deep once the water level goes below 2 feet what happens to your 20 wide trough that you dug what happens they are all dried at the same time that is why it does not pay for us to even decide to widen the holes and not go deep, we will not even service the nation at all. Because it is not width, it is depth. And the engineer was helping us yesterday to say, most effective wells, most effective borehole that will yield water continuously for years and it will never dry, most of it is not more than six inch diameter. Six inch. But if it goes down 300 feet, 400 feet into the soil, you have reached the water level 
And I was noting as I was trying to draw, you know, my, my diagram. I noted that all you needed is just to tap into the water level. Even if it is the diameter six pipe, it will be shooting forth, shooting forth, shooting forth. You don't even need any extra effort. It will just want to shoot out because water is gushing from under. How many of you again this morning want to be a well for revival? Let's pray about that. Let's pray. With your hand lifted on and say, God, dig into my life until I become your source of blessing in my generation. The one that people will drink and drink and it will never run dry. Lord, bring me to that point where my life is so fresh and is so refreshing that year in, year out, year in, year out, year in, year out, men will drink out of my life and it will never dry again. Lord, make me a spring. A spring. Not a tank. A spring. Springing up with fresh water of life. Blessing my generation. Lord, make me a river. Keep flowing. 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 Out of my belly. To resource my generation. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, do you know that this request we are making from God, God wants to answer it. Yesterday I began to show you that even the Holy Spirit, the very purpose why the Holy Spirit had been given is to dig is to dig into our personality until the river of living water begins to flow. And the process that the Holy Spirit has shown us of digging this hole I spoke so much yesterday about graders as different from diggers. Graders, they are useful when you want to clear a road. But if they are not ready to build your road, don't bring graders. Because once the graders grade your road and they are not ready to build it with quota, you have opened your road to what? Erosion. It pains me that what many of us have been exposed to in life as Christians are graders. They opened up they opened up our lives with a grader and left it there. So erosion of all kinds have taken place. But you know what God wanted? As he confronted that woman of Samaria, he said, the water that shall give him shall do what? Shall become in him a well springing up. That's what God was looking for. He again shouted a search. 
If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and do what? And drink. Out of his belly. So which means actually the ditches that God is talking about is you, is me. Hallelujah. So when God said, go and make this valley full of ditches, he means go and make this valley full of men and women into whom I have dug deep. So you see what God is telling us to do? Go and fill Botswana with ditches. Men and women into whom I have dug deep. That we resource the whole of that land with fresh water. Go and fill Zimbabwe with men and women into whom I have done what? I have dug deep. Go and feed South Africa. Go and feed Swaziland. Go to Lesotho. And make this valley full of ditches. Don't look for wind. Don't look for rain. Go and do this. I will feed the land with water. Even though crusades that are organized in stadium may be wonderful for grading, for clearing of bush, but crusades may never lead to revival. It will be an event. Usually it's very costly. Sometimes you call millions of rands to do a three-day crusade or a four-day crusade. You can even set up the organizational uh, offices just for a crusade of four days. And the organization is running for about six months. People are being paid. And as the whole thing gathers, everybody is excited. But two weeks after the crusade, it's finished. You cannot trace anything again. God is not asking us to do that. We know what God is asking us to do. And we are committed to doing that. And I'm telling you that the entire world, the whole church world, they are waking up again. There are discussions in different parts of the world now. And, are, and you know the discussion they said? They said, we have spent decades of evangelism. We have popularized the world. We popularized. Not that we populated. And they're asking, what is the way forward? Mission organizations, they are meeting. They are asking a question. What is the way forward? After 100 years that we have been working, and the Holy Spirit is saying, the way forward. Discipleship. But you see, in my understanding of discipleship that God is asking us to do, he's again not talking about a slogan. It's not talking about a three-week or a three-month course. He is talking about digging ditches, creating depths, 
into lives of people that will become resourceful as to fill the land with the blessing of the kingdom. Hallelujah. So this money, because that is the commission, that is what will solve the challenge of our generation. And I was surprised that when Jesus Christ stepped out, as he began to preach, the next thing I saw him doing, do you know the next thing I saw him doing? I saw him calling men, say, you, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, let's turn. If you have our study outline that you have been using, bring it out, because we may refer to it occasionally. The reason why I wanted to bring it out is because, you know, this study, you are going to study it again when you get home. Am I correct? You are going to look through it again. As far as I'm concerned, it's a starter. Itself is not discipleship, but it is a starter. At least it helps you to know where we are going and what you are signing your life for if you do. If at the end of this meeting you deliberately say, Lord, dig me. Dig into my life until I become that well that can resource my generation. And I don't want you to do it without hope because God doesn't do useless things. Amen? If there's nothing that will come out of it, God will not bother you. When God began to confront me years ago with this matter, honestly, my first question is, Lord, what, what will come out of my life? Especially as I see so many of my friends, colleagues, and classmates running everywhere doing things. Some even came to tell me and said, look, we have started our ministry. We have done this. And I'm saying, God, this brother has gone. This brother has gone. This brother has gone. Why are you tying me down? You know what God said? He said, where have they gone? Where are they going? Settle down to what I'm doing in your life. I said, but you located me here. You tied me down here in this corner. What? How? Lord God. I was crying. And God said, that's not the issue. When what I am cooking in your life, when it gets done, the aroma of it will spread all over the land. And people will be drawn to the aroma. Stay on the fire yet. I want to inform you, brothers and sisters. When what God is doing in your life is done, you won't be spending so much money on publicity. It will publicize itself. You won't be writing letters for connections. It has capacity of drawing men. It has power to compel men. It took God to persuade me. You know, I use the word persuade. Because my mind was dangling everywhere. Because everybody seemed to be running up and down with graders. God, he said, no. And I remember, just tell you something before you go. Remember. We were in the fellowship with some brothers. We were in leadership. 
And when God began to confront me with this, some of the issues we are going to be sharing today. And as I was responding personally to God, sometimes it would take us, we would do a Bible study. A little of the Bible study you are going to, we are going through today. A little of it, not all of it. God confronted me with that study one day. And for maybe for three days, I was struggling with the scriptures. We are going to read them now. And because I was the Bible study leader, I prepared it as a study outline. So and I gathered these brothers and sisters. We went to a small village to do Bible study. When we started, we had not gone to more than one paragraph. Eight hours has passed. And everybody was, we were all crying. We were all terribly affected. And I remember some of the brothers came to face me. They said, oh, we can't go back to campus again. Everything is finished. I was begging some people. I said, don't, don't do that. Let's finish first. But from that day, something finished about me. So when I took it to our fellowship, the general big fellowship, and I said, so I said, no, 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 we don't want that kind of thing here. People will be confused. One of the brothers that spoke so vehemently and silenced it, I kept quiet, but I kept, God kept dealing with my own life because there's no other way for me. We all left. I think five years after, I was invited to a meeting to go and preach. And he was also invited to go and preach. And we were in the same accommodation. So his room is here, my room is here. But because his messages will come before mine, Sometimes he will go ahead of me to the meeting. And he's a very powerful, eloquent preacher. And he has been preaching. So one of those days that I came to speak, something happened. I don't know what happened. I was just preaching simple from the Bible. When the meeting, the people in the meeting broke up, the kind of conviction that the Holy Spirit brought into this meeting was so much that, you know, he had finished preaching in the morning. He came to preach around 8 to 10. I was to take the meeting from 10 to 11.30 or something. So when he finished his preaching, he went back. He didn't stay. Are you understanding? He went. So he didn't know what I preached. But the confusion was that from 11.30 when I stopped and people came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the people were weeping and crying and praying from that 11.30 till about 4 p.m. when he came back to take his second message. Nobody could stop. The organizers went and met him and said, Brother, God started moving since uh, Brother Gbile finished speaking. We have not been able to stop the meeting. People have been crying. People have been praying. In fact, we have not gone for lunch. So can you please postpone your message until we are able to calm the people down? He said, What is that? What is that? So he went. When he got there, he couldn't stop anything. 
he was himself confused. So when we return in the evening, he said, Billy, he used to call me, that name we used to call ourselves as, as young people. You know, we have nicknames that time. <laughs> so he called me that name. He asked. The question he asked that was, that is making me to, to, to talk to you about it, was that he said, Billy, when did this thing happen to you? He said, this is the thing that I have been fasting and praying to get. How did you enter into this? You just spoke gently. And the whole place, people were repenting on their own. They were crying. And I'm telling you the truth. That when what we are talking about begins to happen to you, are you hearing me? You will see something. Oh God. You will see a move of God. The meeting I'm describing to you today happened 24 years ago. And the people that were affected, I still meet some of them. I met some of them last year. And they are still talking about the meeting. We are not talking about something you do and after two days people are forgotten. We are not talking of that. That's a useless work. We are talking about becoming an influence that nobody can rub off in years. So my friend asked me, how did you enter into this? What did you do? Show me the secrets. I called him by his own pet name also, the way we call ourselves. Because we are friends. I called him, I said, <laughs> I called him. I said, do you remember in the chemistry lecture theater when I was telling you something that has happened to me and you said nobody will, will understand it. I said, when you silenced me that time, I continued. I continued. He said, eh? We finished the meeting. He left and I left. And so he began, because of that experience, to invite me to come and make input into his ministry. I was happy to do so, but there's a problem. You know the problem? When he has put a meeting together and the people have come, when he had finished all the big, 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 big talk, and I don't know how to talk big. I just want God to do something. So we, I just go there. So one of the days again, I just took a little discussion on being a friend of Jesus. That's all. The same issue took place. Oh. He himself is the organizer, is the controller of the meeting. He was not able to stop the meeting. We went back again to his house because he's lodging me now. He asked me, he said, oh, he said, Billy. He said, what is the secret? Look, the people have been held since. They are not willing to go away again. What have you got? Then, 
15 years after we have departed, we met in UK. You know what challenged me? That made me to be convinced that I must dig this thing. I want to continue. Listen, I want to continue. I may not be wide. I want to be deep. I may not be spreading like this, but I want to grow. We met in United Kingdom. And the people he was gathering, I was surprised that everywhere he went, all the people that he thought he was gathering, each of them said, look, Brother Gwile came. That was when my life changed. That was this happened. Ah. So one of those evenings, he gathered all of them. He brought them to where I was lodging. He said, Brother Gwile, we have been trying to invite you. You couldn't come. We decided to organize ourselves and bring ourselves to your lodging. At least you, are not need, you don't need to travel. We just want to be with you this evening. I said, but brother, you can help the brothers now. He says, not like that. The people themselves say they want to hear this. You know, I wish I could help my friend. I wish I could get him, but it was too late. He's now too popular to be dog. You know, it will take the grace of God for you to start digging a man that has become a rock. So one day I went into the work that this brother is doing. And when I got there, everything is just like this. And I felt like crying. I felt like saying, brother, you are working hard. But we are not seeing something. But I knew the omission was the digging. Even if you don't want to be dog, I want to be dog. I'm, I'm just praying. Even if you are not interested, even if you are one of those who love superficialities, who don't want to go far with God, you won't stop me. I have tasted it. What I'm talking to you, I have tasted it. But it is not enough for me. I want more. I want more. I want more. I want more. More about Jesus will I know. More of his holy witness. More of his saving fullness. More of his love who died for me. More. More about Jesus. More. More about Jesus. More of his saving fullness. More of his love who died for me. It's not in our hymn, so don't worry. Let's go on. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm sharing this with you 
because you are God's first set of ditches he is wanting to focus upon in South Africa. Hallelujah! And if the Holy Ghost will give you strength to, to, to continue, nobody can predict. Nobody can predict how far men will drink from your life. You know I was worried. I said, God, this thing you are doing with me, nobody knows me anywhere. Because look, when you are digging ditches into a life, you concentrate. In fact, whenever you see sites of boreholes that have been dug, do you know what used to surprise me? Is that the site of borehole, when they are finished digging it, you will just see something like a small pipe coming out. It doesn't occupy the ground. Are you hearing me? It doesn't occupy the ground. You just see it like that. But that's something that is servicing a very, very wide community. People are drinking from it. I was thinking that God, since I'm not here and there, since I'm not here and there, you know, I go everywhere, I see people will just put their photographs on the wall. Wow. They put wow. It used to intimidate me sometimes. It used to make me feel, ah, these people are known everywhere, known everywhere. But you know, God is very gracious to me. I don't know how he deals with you, but God has helped me a lot. You know, one day, I went to a city, and the photograph of this man was everywhere. And I was there. Ah, everybody has known him. Everybody is there. Everybody will go there and go say, let me, let me, let me, let me show you something. I was surprised that I met people. And I was saying, oh, there's a, a big meeting that is going to hold in this city. And all the people I'm talking to, they didn't know. But the posters was everywhere. That was when my struggle with printing posters finished. God told me that the fact that you see posters on the street everywhere, it does not in any sense mean that people know that anything is going on. So, ah, God, is it like that? He said, it's like that. He said, but these people will not understand. If you tell them not to print their handbills and posters, they will be offended because they don't know what else. So they must keep doing that. But you, let me cook what I'm cooking in your life. The aroma spreads and people know. I don't want to bore you with stories, but um, God has encouraged me. He has encouraged me to be a disciple. He has encouraged me to settle my life in this issue. He has encouraged me. I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged. I don't feel I'm losing anything for being his disciple. I don't feel I'm losing anything. I don't feel anybody is bypassing me. That God is tying me down and is digging my life, 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 almost on the same spot. You know, using the spiral screw like this, like this, and he's digging deep and digging up and digging deep and digging up. I, you see, before I used to think that I'm stagnant. But now I know I am not. I'm not worried. 
he has encouraged me to settle down. I think I'm settled. I think my heart is completely settled. I want to be a disciple. I want him to dig me. At first I thought it is wideness that will make me affect my generation. I didn't know that it was depth. Depth, depth, depth. I didn't know that depth is what God is looking for. Not with. Praise the Lord. So now I go forward with you. I want to go on with you if I'm sure that you are interested. Eh? I want to be sure that you are interested. Because it's no use. It's no use telling you what you are not interested in. Eh? You are interested. You want to be a ditch for revival. Whatever it will cost. Eh? Because that's where the action is. All right. So let's follow me now. Our Lord Jesus did not just admit anyone into discipleship without meeting his own conditions. And this is very emphatic. I'm reading from page three of your outline. Is that okay? I'm reading from page three. His own conditions. It's very emphatic. And please take note that these conditions are prerequisite conditions to enter into the discipleship process. Fulfilling these conditions is only to admit you into the relationship that will make you what God wants you to be. Oh Lord, God will help you as he began to help me. Do you know now, the thing that I'm going to be sharing with you is, 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 is good. Do you know why? At least, at least, honestly speaking, if you have not seen anybody that has, at least in a measure, experienced and proved that this thing, even though it appears harsh, that is good. It's effective. It's glorious. It's profitable. If you have not seen anyone, there is one brother here. I am one. To the point that I want to tell you that even if you offer me money as to take me away from this, I will not take it. I'm not making mouth. Are you hearing me? I'm telling you the truth. And even if I were to be left alone. I will still go on. I'm looking back at the first time I came into critical understanding of these conditions. The first time I came critically into it, this was. 32 years ago. And the kind of decisions I need to take that day when I saw what God is demanding, my heart jumped. I was shivering. I said, mm -mm, Lord, no! 
And the Holy Spirit says, you know we are not forcing you. It's not by force. If any man will come after me, read Matthew 16, 24 quickly. Somebody is reading Matthew 16, 24. Yeah. Uh -huh. Anyone who will come after me, he must deny himself and, and take up his cross and follow me. What version did you read? NIV. Who carries King James? Quickly, King James. Uh -huh. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Are we together to that point? Now, I want us to settle one issue before we go ahead. I had to settle that issue. It was important for me to settle that issue. God did not rush me. And because I have followed God, who didn't rush me? Praise the Lord. Who did he incapacitate me? Please listen. Oh. It gives me liberty of relating with brothers and sisters without forcing them. Without incapacitating them. The question is, if any man will come after me, what does that mean now? Voluntary. Have you noticed that now? That discipleship that makes you a ditch in God's hand to resource your generation is a voluntary choice. You are not amputated to do it. Are we together? It's not because God has trapped you and closed the door and said, now you are trapped. You have to do this. No. Can I tell you what happened to me? When God confronted me with this, I say, God, you mean you want to, you want to, you want to make me useless? He said, no. It's if you want to be my disciple. If you don't want, you are free. Two times. When I complained, I said, God said, look, look, I'm not forcing you. You are free, free. You can be, you are free like a bed. Be going anywhere. You know, sometimes I will even compare. I say, but what of these people? What of these people? Are they not also people? Are they not Christians? Why are you insisting on me? Ah. Uh -uh. I'm saying, God, what is all this? God said, ah, I didn't know you want to be like them. Go. <sighs> oh, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, God did not force me. This thing that is happening to me, this thing that I'm doing, God didn't force me. God didn't force me. Let me tell you what God did. I said, God... If I will follow this, people will think it's because I did not pass my exam. It's because I am not brilliant. That's why I am doing this. 
I say, God, before I we I we agree in my class, I want to be one of the top three. Look at a foolish boy talking to God. <laughs> so I want to be one of the top three. When I am the best, then come again with this condition. <laughs> hey, hallelujah. Do you know God? Do you know what God did? He did it. I was one of the top three. All the departments were looking for me. So I didn't enter into discipleship because I was frustrated. God didn't frustrate me in order to, to incapacitate me to be a disciple. The condition for discipleship, brother, is voluntary. The voluntariness of discipleship may be the reason why so many people are misbehaving. Because God will not force you. He didn't force me. I got everything. Opportunities was everywhere. Then one day, are you hearing me? He says, if any man will be my disciple, let him deny himself. I said, Lord, I want to be your disciple. He said, but this is the condition. This is the condition. Hallelujah. So let's take note. The first important word in that condition is if any man wants to be a follower of mine. Let's confirm that in Luke 9, verse 23. Luke 9, 23, quickly. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. This morning, you are going to do something good. Even in my life. I know. I want him to dig me more. I want to dig more. I want to be more and more. More, more of him. 923 please. I need somebody from this side. 923. What are you carrying? Alright. Help us read King James first. We will come to you on Amplified. Here. Yes. And he said to them all, uh -huh. If any man will come after me, He said to them all, He made it available to all, but He made it a voluntary choice. Now, yes? Let him deny himself. Let him. Again, what do you notice there now? If any man will come after me, let him. What do you mean by that? What do you understand by that statement? It will be the individual choice. And nobody must choose it for you. If it is legalistic, are you hearing me? Somebody will force you. But discipleship is not legalistic. It's voluntary. And because it's voluntary, it is your voluntary choice. Let him deny himself, yes. And take up his cross daily. Let him take up his cross daily. Uh -huh. And follow me. And let him on his own. Do what? Now, let me come down here now. Sorry. If I say Moses... Follow me. When I say follow me, and I didn't say more than that, if he followed, what does that mean? Eh? 
He chose to follow. But supposing, sit down there. And I say, Moses. <laughs> Does he have a choice to follow me? <laughs> eh? Poor Moses. He has fallen into the hand of a tax master now. Now, are we going to say he is following him? What am I doing? I'm dragging him. Discipleship is not a dragging. It's a voluntary following. If you are expecting anybody to be dragging you, you are, you are making a mistake. When we will finish this morning, and you say, I want God to dig me, it will be your voluntary choice. I wouldn't be coming to drag you. Don't expect prof to be coming and be dragging you. Don't expect somebody to come and say, hey, did, did you not say you want to be a disciple? You want to be a disciple? Come now, come now, come now, come now, come now. You, 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 you. No. If any man wishes to be my disciple, let him, it is him who will do it. Let him take up his own cross. Let him follow me. Voluntary. Many people think when we are talking of discipleship, we are removing people's liberty. No. That's blackmail. That's what graders. They tell people who don't want to be serious. They say, are you going to that place? Where yeah, before you eat, they say your disciple must know. No. The discipleship that God taught me is voluntary. He didn't force me. When I say I don't want, he didn't punish me. If anybody say, if you are not his disciple, you will be sick. That's not the word of God. God will not threaten you with sickness so that you can be running after him. No. That's why even those who chose not to follow in discipleship, he still gave them food. So when a prosperity preacher is preaching and he says, yes, in fact, you know, that does not mean anything. The reason is because our God, Jesus is so gracious that even when the people of Israel chose not to follow him and they were going around in the wilderness to perish, do you know he was still giving them manna? Money and evening. When they said they want to eat meat, he gave them quails they ate. He was taking care of them. But he knew that these people will perish in the wilderness. But he still fed them. It was not hunger that killed them. Friends, even if you don't follow in discipleship, God can still give you food to eat. Why? Even his enemies, who don't even come to church at all, the rain, when it falls, does it only fall on the farm of Christians? Does it not farm on everybody? Let me tell you. 
Even if you choose not to be a disciple, that does not stop God from giving you ordinary things that he gives even unbelievers. You are not anything. But this condition of following Jesus is voluntary. What did I say? It's voluntary. It's you who will make that choice. Repeat that verse 23 again, sister. And he said to them all, Yes. If any man will come after me, uh -huh. let him deny himself. Yes. And take up his cross daily. Yes. And follow me. He is the one to do it. So thank you. Sit down now. Immediately from that passage, we can identify three concurrent conditions here. What are the three conditions? Let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross daily. Let him follow me. And these three conditions, why did we say is concurrent? If you read the scripture very well, you will notice that there is a conjunction in between them. There is an additive conjunction. What is the additive conjunction in that sentence? And let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Why is it concurrent? Is that if all these three will be happening simultaneously. If it is not to be concurrent, you know what he would have said? Let him deny himself. Then take up his cross. Then follow me. Then it will have been it will have been eh? It will have been successive. Say, let him deny himself. When he has finished, deny himself. Finish. <laughs> he will not say stage two. Let him take up his cross. Then after he has finished taking up his cross daily, <laughs> if that takes 10 years, then stage three, follow me. No. They are concurrent. They must be happening at the same time. If you do one and you did not do the other, it's not complete. There is nobody who say I have denied myself and he has not taken his cross daily that is seriously a disciple. 